Please welcome Dr. Beth Latimer. One of the main issues here is that we're trying to change the name of PANDAS to make it less radioactive. And there's a lot of discussion about whether to call it autoimmune encephalitis, the basal ganglia, post-streptococcal infection, autoimmune encephalitis, the striatum. I know Dr. Shimasaki suggested a few other things last night. And it'll be interesting to find out how that all turns out. Okay, so one of the um, things that I wanted to go over, and we went over yesterday, and I'll do it um, again today, is that the um, general physical exam is really important in these kids, and um, particularly looking for evidence of streptococcal infection that presents in many different ways and is often overlooked in the in the in the pediatrician's office. I think. Um, Part of that is because the way medicine is practiced today, you know, you're going in on these five and 10, 15 minute consults and they don't take the kids' clothes off and it's just, uh, um, that's medicine um, in um, 2019 and really since probably 1990 or so. Um, so you want to look for evidence of streptococcal infection. Um, careful examination of the skin, looking for sandpaper rash, pastillas lines, red cheeks, with clearly defined borders. Sometimes those little crusty things at the corner of the mouth are angular chelitis. That can be staph and strep. Impetigo. Um, a lot of little girls have um, vaginal strep and they can have vulva redness. Um, you can have penile strep. Um, and the perianal strep, I think, is really important because unless you really look for it, you're not going to find it. And you do have to get the kids prepped for that, saying, look, I'm not just being invasive here. I'm looking because strep can be on your bottom and I want to take a look. Um, also, following strep, you can have peeling of the fingers and the toes. And then, you know, you look for the in the throat, but and frankly, most of these kids, they have what I call stealth strep. And they don't really have a lot of symptoms in their throat. And they have small um, tonsils. Gut taste psoriasis is the other thing. You know, eczema should be on the inside of the arms. Psoriasis is on the outside of the arms. So when the, the parents come in and they say the child has eczema, and it's in the elbows and the knees, instead of behind the knees and in the inside, then it's probably psoriasis. And gut taste psoriasis can be caused by strep. Um, on the mental status exam, this is really important. It's completely different in a toddler and uh, little kids versus adolescents. The little, the little kids have less regulatory capacity, shall we say, and can be just completely and totally out of control. But they all have that irritable, burdened, terrified, when are we leaving look, um, which is why I allow them to spend as much time on their iPads as they would like. Um, because it distracts them from the, you know, the inter interaction in the office. If I see someone with migraines, I'm like, get off the phone, you know. But, but these kids, you know, you got to be a little bit more gentle. Um, um, they're hyperactive, they're inattentive, um, and they can vary throughout the exam. You know, they can come in looking one way, and 20 minutes later they go down. Their pupils can dilate, and throughout the hour and a half, two hour exam, um, they. Um, it can have episodes of rage, sometimes quite violent, um, but they're sad. You, they, they don't smile. You can't. You you can't even get like a little. You can't joke around with them and you know tease them a little bit or get any kind of a, a joke out of them. And sometimes they're mute. And um, there is something in childhood called selective mutism, um, where kids will not talk outside the house, but they will talk as they're falling asleep at night and just say a little bit. And those children have the same EEG abnormality that we see in, in PANDAS, which is interesting. The adolescents are much more organized in their ability to keep themselves together. Um, so they are, tend to be, particularly the girls, but they tend to be burdened, sad, flat, anxious. They don't move. They don't want to tell you what's going on in their head. I never want to, I t always tell them, do you have intrusive thoughts? These are the types of intrusive thoughts people have, sexual, religious, death, dying. I don't want to know what they are. I just need to know if you have them. Because I think it, it creates a new memory of having that trauma, of having to discuss that with the doctor. And um, it really does, it doesn't add anything to the situation. Um, they're um, at times agitated, at times impulsive, somewhat perseverative, um, and sometimes um, it's difficult to keep them on track and to get them to stop interrupting their parents so that you can get the history. So sometimes you have to separate um, people out. But, um, and also unkempt. I've seen many children who just have, they haven't washed their hair, they haven't changed their clothes, and they just, they're urinating on themselves, they're just completely and totally unkempt. Um, 
the, the, the burdened appearance cannot be understated. So I tell them, I want to see, like as a little kid, let me see the pictures of the first and second birthday party. They all have them on their phone. And, and you see this bright and happy child, and all of a sudden you, there's a child who looks completely different. They might have gotten used to it over time, and there, it's, but um, not usually. But, but it, it is, um, it's very apparent when you look at the pictures before and after. And if you're going to look at any videos, the parents, it's very good to take videos. Your children don't want you to take videos, so you have to do it secretly. And never, ever show them the video because they don't remember what happened during the video. And it's really traumatic for them. Um, so I never look at those in the office. Um, so again, the observation of the family, um, it's, it's these, you, you, you guys are desperate. Everybody knows that. Um, and you've been from one doctor to another. And um, frequently, like, I always tell parents, do not destroy your marriage because of this. Just try to stick together and get through it. Um, and um, keep the other children safe, keep your child safe as, as much as you can. And if the, par if the grandparents think your child's spoiled, just try to ignore it and, and move along. Because I hear that as a story a lot. You know, well, my mother came down and she just thinks we don't discipline this kid enough. And I'm like, well, you can't. You can't discipline the kids. You can't parent them in a normal way. And I know that Dean Chalpion talked about that this morning, and um, he's been very helpful with a lot of these kids and their families. Um, so in terms of the, gen just the neurologic exam in particular, I wanted to point out a few things. Um, these children are hypotonic, meaning their tone is floppy. They sit in the chair and they're hunched over. Um, and I think this is why they get diagnosed with Ehlers-Danlos, or hypermobility syndrome. Um, but because Ehlers-Danlos, the genetic type, does not go away when they get better. Um, they have what is called a motor apraxia. This is a motor planning problem. So if I tell them to, um, you know, take their right hand and put it in the left ear, they go, this, like, this pause, you know. And they might do this, they might, I said, other right hand, you know, and it will take them a long time to get to that. Or if I stand in front of them and say, I want you to hold your hands out like this, you get all this mirroring kind of activity going on. But if you just ask them to copy what you're doing, they can usually do it without any difficulty because it doesn't require motor planning to get processed through the basal ganglia. Um, we see, um, um, but these kids, although they're low tone and look like, Floppy rag dolls, they are extremely strong. Strength and tone have nothing to do with one another. Um, the reflexes um, are not hyperactive. Now, this is important because hyperactive reflexes can be seen in other things in the differential diagnosis, most notably Wilson's disease, which is an accumulation of copper in the brain and in the liver. Um, they do have a, a lot of abnormal movements, but again, you have to look at them as age appropriate, right? We look at a two-year-old who's walking down the street or painting and their tongues are coming out and they're twisting around. But by the time kids are seven, eight, or nine, they should be able to be pretty steady. Um, and the children have a whole variety of different movements that um, um, most neurologists can identify, but any tremors, choreiform movements, twisting movements, they have, they have chorea, they have everything. This is some, um, everyone's seen examples of the handwriting. The, the handwriting is as important as the teacher's comments on the side of the page. So sometimes you'll see in the child's journal, write neater, write neater, and then two weeks later it'll be like, great job, you've really improved your handwriting. And <laughs> you don't even have to look at the handwriting, just the teacher's comments sometimes will do it. This is a child who um, had IV, failed after IVIG, and then after rituximab obviously had much better handwriting. Um, now, one thing you always have to know, too, is what's, what's absent, right? These kids don't have seizures, they don't have myoclonus, they're not in a coma, and they don't have focal neurologic signs as if they had a stroke or there's a, a certain part of what we call the cerebral cortex. So this is the deep gray cortical manner of the brain that's involved. So if they had these things, they'd be in the ICU, in a coma, getting treated. It, so that's why you end up with this sort of walking wounded, you know, population that gets diagnosed with conversion disorder and 
child abuse and a whole bunch of other things because it's not so obvious to um, someone who doesn't know what this condition looks like, what it looks like. Um, so wh where is the controversy? Um, you know, we've known for centuries and centuries about Sydenham's Korea. I think the first tonsillectomy was done in 10 AD. Um, um, but what is not known is why this, on, this epidemic is going on now. You know, do we have new strains of strep? Did we stop taking tonsils out, which is my little pet theory. I mean, we took 1.4 million tonsils in 1959. We took out 300,000 a year, 200 or so in the 80s and 90s when um, HMOs decided to make the decisions about tonsillectomies. And um, is the resistance just due to, like, the world is flat? You know, this is the way we've always done it. This is, we don't know what this is. We're not going to try to figure it out. Complete lack of curiosity. And I think that that is an ongoing problem in medicine in general because of the, the extreme amount of burnout in medicine. I just read an article this week in Medscape um, that 49% of doctors consider themselves burnt out, 16% have considered suicide, and 2% have, and one doctor commits suicide every day. So there's a lot of burnout. So there's a, you know, we learn what we learn during our internships and residencies and medical school, but we, you've got to keep learning. You know, the world doesn't stop when you finish your your training. Um, but I think for a lot of people, it has now. So we met in 2010. That was the first meeting um, the, um, to develop the white paper that described the criteria. And then we met, and I think this was 2013. Uh, it might be a little bit later to develop the um, a, a sort of a consortium um, of doctors around the country um, to come up with some reasonable guidelines for treatment recommendations. And this was really based on the fact that there was not a ton of literature. We had studies on plasmapheresis from the NIH. We had our Georgetown study on plasmapheresis, which allowed the American Academy of Apheresis to designate pandas as a treatable condition with pheresis. But we didn't have like tons of long protocol-driven research-based guidelines. So um, evident, what we call evidence-based medicine. But that doesn't mean you can stop being a doctor. You, mean, you have to keep thinking. So we, there was a, a group that got together and we decided on a, a reasonable um, paradigm of guidelines. So the, there was three, three, really three, the, what the Sue Sweeto calls the three-legged stool. You know, the, control of the infection that's um, um, propagating this illness, review of the literature regarding other autoimmune encephalitis, encephalitis such as MS, Guillain-Barre syndrome, transverse myelitis. I mean, we've got a whole bucket load of autoimmune diseases in neurology. And, um, and what we do for those and how we could apply those to this condition. And then um, the review of the psychiatric um, interventions including psychopharmacologic approaches to manage behavior and CBT therapies. So um, note, I'm going to leave this to, um, to Dr. Hurley when he discussed it, but tonsillectomy was not discussed at this consortium meeting, and there was a lot of debate about it. A lot of people just didn't think it was a good idea, but I do. But the, the results, really, we came up with three groups, and I think this is going to be very important going forward. We need homogeneous groups to come up with different protocols to find out what the best outcome is based on the group. You know, you can't just take a bucket of five-year-olds and say, this is how we're going to educate them, and they're all going to end up the same way. That's not how things work in life. So this looks a little reminiscent of the MS um, type of thing, too. So you got new onset. Um, now, these kids are very easy to treat, right? They, you get them quickly, and you give them so that the B cells don't develop a lot of immune memory to attack the um, um, immune system on an ongoing basis. So um, the consensus was we work them up for infection, treat any infection, refer to cognitive behavioral therapy, um, consider antibiotics and non steroidal agents, um, consider steroids in the severe kids, and if the kids were really con severe, consider high-dose IVIG. Now, in the relapsing and remitting group, this is the kids who come and go they're great one for a month or two, and then they sink back down again. Um, again, typical workup for infection. In this case, we're starting to really look at the immune system to figure out if we can find out if there's immune deficiencies. And these kids do have a typical immune, what we call profile. 
They have to low Ig levels. They have high CD3s, high CD4s, um, high IgEs, low IgG subclass twos. Because it's just kind of a, a compilation, and they have low white counts. The white count, you know, the white count's five to ten. These kids' white counts three point six, three point seven. I would say probably fifty percent of the time. They just have a low white count. Um, I don't know why. And and then and those kids with absent and remitting, you would consider high dose IV IG depending upon the severity of condition if they don't respond to antibiotics and, and steroids. So the chronic static group is the most difficult, right? These are the kids who have not been treated and have gone on for a long time. And sometimes 15, 20 years, sometimes into adulthood. And this is a, a more difficult situation. You do want to work up for infection, but you know the infection is probably remote. And the strep happened a long time ago. And there's something else that's triggered it at this point. Um, you do want to give a dose of high-dose steroids to see if it works. And then we use, I use them, high-dose IV steroids, and that's the recommendation. And then there's this whole compilation of possibilities that was suggested by the consortium and combining up to four immune modulators, including steroids, IVIG, plasmapheresis, and rituximab. So steroids work to just say, shut, shut the immune system down, stop making antibodies, close the blood-brain barrier. IVIG works. We don't quite know how. It raises the Ig level so high that you probably start making your own immune globulin, and also you make immune complexes. And if you have another way, example I use is if you have like a hundred red cars on the road, aiming towards the same direction, and you put a thousand white cars on the road, the red cars are going to get pushed out of the way. And then. Um, plasmapheresis, where we just clean the blood, take out the antibodies. That's not going to work long term. It's a, it's a wonderful temporary solution, but it doesn't work long term. And rituximab, which sort of resets the B cells. Rituximab is a 20-year-old medicine. Its primary indication was for B cell lymphoma, but it's being used much more commonly for autoimmune diseases like lupus, rheumatoid arthritis. Recently got an indication for polyangiitis, granulomatosis. I Kind of, I'm surprised they went after that because it's not that common, and it was at the end of their patent, but they did anyway. Um, but it's being widely used in all autoimmune diseases. So with the steroids and anti-inflammatories, um, when it's mild, you can use non-steroidals, and it's quite remarkable how well these kids respond to ibuprofen. Almost, it's like dramatic. They can be completely out of their minds. You give them ibuprofen, and when's dinner? It's like, what happened to you? Um, and then, um, um, but if we have a, like a severe episode, I'll give you an example. I had a child who I treated with IVIG, and she was doing beautifully. And then she had a peanut allergy as well. And she got sort of exposed at a salad bar where there was some cross-contamination. She had a horrible immune reaction and, um, and a horrible flare. I brought her in and gave her a massive dose of IV steroids, and she was fine after that. She didn't need a repeat dose of IVIG or anything else. So then the use of non-steroidal agents is always preferred because steroids are generally not good for us, right? If you have someone on steroids long term, you develop adrenal insufficiency. The adrenal gland sits on top of the kidneys. The adrenal gland is your flight and fright you know, reactor. So if you get really sick or septic with an infection, your adrenal gland fires up all kinds of hormones um, to keep your blood pressure up. So we don't want people to be immune deficient and to be have adrenal insufficiency. So in any condition, Crohn's disease, any of these other autoimmune conditions, you know, stabilize on steroids and then move to a non-steroidal agent is the general um, approach. So in the new onset kids, the use of non-steroidal agents um, was preferred um, um, in, in some cases due to less side effects. Um, but in the new onset, the, this, uh, the consortium agreed on six months of high-dose IVIG. That was the agreement, and I'm not going to dispute it, except that I don't generally do it, um, because I think that there are some risks of high-dose IVIG monthly. One is that you create more immune complexes. The second is that there is a risk of venous thrombosis. This stuff is thick and viscous, and it can cause a clot in the brain. So you have to make sure your children, if they get IVIG, hydrate, 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 hydrate. And if they don't, if they're still having a headache on day three or four after IVIG, 
go to the emergency room and get an intravenous dose of normal saline fluids. Because as much as you drink, there's, the kids are nauseous sometimes, but you've got to get the, 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 the fluid into the blood vessels, not just ex outside the blood vessels, because you don't want to develop that clot. You can develop um, aseptic meningitis too, which is just a headache, really, and a stiff neck. But it's not a, like a true bacterial infection of the um, meninges. So um, plasma, now plasma freezes, it, we've, we, I've, I've used a lot of it. It's really good. It works quickly, and it works very well for children who have sudden weight loss. And you cannot underestimate the severity of the risk associated with someone losing 20% of their body weight. And that includes a 50-pound child losing 10 pounds. That's a big deal, right? So they say, well, they only lost 10 pounds. Well, they were only 50 pounds to begin with. So when you start losing weight like that, your electrolytes get all out of whack, and your heart starts to suffer because you start to lose heart muscle, your, blood, your heart rate drops, and that's a very risky situation and should not be um, ignored. Um, steroids um, often are used as for diagnosis and for treatment, and sometimes we go right to um, rituximab if the symptoms are severe and they respond to steroids and they're not um, candidates for plasmapheresis. Now, to be a candidate for plasmapheresis, you have to be stable enough to go to the hospital. And the nurses who do plasmapheresis are not psychiatric nurses. So that creates a real big problem, and that's our, one of our biggest challenges, I think, at this point. And, and the relapsing remitting group, if I do IVIG once, then the kids are fine for a year or two, you can do it again. And they'll come in and say, it's back. I, I need another dose. I need more IVIG. Like having a 10-year-old come into your office and say, can you please give me IVIG again and make me sick as a dog for a week? You know that there's just something real associated with that. Again, for plasma phoresis is for extreme flares in psychiatrically stable children who are not going to take lines out. And then you do move to rituximab in this group if the baseline is deteriorating. So if each subsequent flare is getting worse and worse and your baseline is deteriorating, then you can move to rituximab. And then with very delayed care, you might use a, do a trial of IVIG. Plasma freeze is not indicated in this condition. And um, also in this con with very delayed care, they're often on a lot of medicines. If you do plasma phoresis, you're taking all the medicine out all of a sudden. And that's generally not a good idea. Um, and we move to rituxin on those kids. So I'd like to just look at a few pearls. If I bring the kids in, I say, bring me all your, your pediatric records, which with electronic medical records is like a case and a half. But you want to look for a choppy growth curve. So some of these kids will have had a milder episode earlier. So instead of a curve that's moving along the 30th percentile, they'll be moving along the 30th, and they're not gaining weight for six months between three and four. And then they kind of go up again. And you're like, well, why did that happen? And you just have to be aware that there are sometimes mild episodes that precede the real big one. And one of them is um, sensory issues. The kid went to pre-K, couldn't sit on the rug, couldn't tolerate the noise. Mother had to pick him up, had some separation anxiety, had oppositional behavior, probably because they had OCD or separation anxiety and were acting out so they could get out of that situation. They've been seen by the pediatrician because they went to the, they developed bedwetting after they were toilet trained or they had urinary frequency again, and someone did a urinalysis on them to see if they had an infection or diabetes, and they didn't. And they were like, well, I don't know what's going on. And then the sleep disturbances. These are profound, and this is well documented in the literature. Um, they have a prolonged time into REM sleep. So it takes them forever to get into REM sleep. And then they have very little REM sleep. They have periodic leg movements during sleep. And, um, and because they don't have any REM sleep, they can't m remember anything that they study, and they, they're exhausted all day. So they can't wake up. They actually do wake up early in the morning. Um, and I follow these kids with, like, um, doing sleep studies is kind of tough because the sleep centers wake you up at 5 o'clock in the morning and send you out. It's not exactly the ideal sleep environment. But... Um, I usually will ask them to put a Fitbit on or an iWatch to monitor. And those things, they're quite good at monitoring sleep architecture. So you can see how much REM sleep, and then you can follow that over time. And then you want to look at um, nuance of difficulty eating. A lot of these children would say, I just feel like something is stuck in my throat. I can't swallow. So you have 
but they can't swallow their own spit. They lose weight and they get full quickly. And again, if you're not eating, you, get, you lose weight, your electrolytes get disrupted, and it's dangerous. And they consider it dangerous in every other condition except pandas. So if a child has got like typical anorexia nervosa, they get admitted to the hospital and get stabilized. But these kids don't often don't because they have other psychiatric stuff and they end up in the psychiatric unit. So the most dangerous area, and I tell all my parents this, and I, if you are worried that your child's gonna hurt themselves, jump out the window, jumping out of the car, hit you while you're driving, um, sled off the roof, elope from school, get a knife, get matches, any of these things. You need to call 911. I know you're all afraid of a psychiatric hospitalization. I know you're all afraid of CPS. You know, we, we will help you with that. But sometimes you need to be stabilized just for the safety of the immediate situation. And I've seen so many families I mean, I have weekends where I get a phone call every single day, and I'm saying, call 911, call 911, call 911, and they just, parents just won't do it. I understand why you won't do it. But I generally also suggest that you go first to your local police department and tell them, look, we get this problem in our house. We have a child who's out of control, we don't have any loaded guns, and if we call you, we need you. So, and we've got a child who's terrified, so don't come in. You know, and terrify them further. But, you know, help us. We need help. So what's happened over the last two decades? Kind of not a lot. I mean, I'd like to say we've made more progress. I mean, we've made a lot of progress, I think, with research. Um, we've established a lot with the, of the validity with the Cunningham panel. Um, I think the sleep studies as a diagnostic tool are helpful. But nothing really substitutes for a good history and, and physical exam. The real problem is that we don't have any place to treat the, these children. They're, they're at home in a situation where everyone has lost it, right? The mother is trying to take care of a child who can't be parented. The father's like, why can't you take care of this child? Or the father is trying to take care of the kid, and the mother says, I need a weekend away. The, the, grand, the, ch the other children are the grandparents. These, these families are in crisis, and then they get accused of child abuse or conversion disorder. And conversion disorder, just to be clear, is when you have a subconscious physical ailment because your consciousness cannot deal with the reality of your situation. We saw a lot of this in the military when I was at Walter Reed. So if someone came back from Granada and he can't feel his arm from here down. Or a child's father's getting deployed to Afghanistan, all of a sudden they can't walk. But there, um, you, the, the one absolute critical aspect of conversion disorder is you never tell the patient they have a conversion disorder because it makes them worse. You tell them, oh, okay, it looks like you have some problems with your muscles or whatever, and we're gonna get you some physical therapy, and you let them work their way out of it. You can't confront something, someone with something that they can't, their own mind can't even be confronted with at that point. It doesn't work and it makes them worse. And psychotropic medications can control some of these symptoms. Some of the other medications can make things worse. So, um, and children, we have one in five children in the United States now on a psychotropic medication. That was not the case in my neighborhood growing up. Either we had the most neglectful parents in the world, <laughs> or we worked things out on the streets. I don't know which it was, but nobody was on psychiatric drugs. And um, now we have one in 50 children with autism. I do believe that many of these children um, who, if this strikes you when you're one or two, you look autistic. I have four and five year olds being diagnosed with new onset autism. I have treated children who've been diagnosed with autism who then no longer have autism. There is a disproportionate number of children who have autism who present them with pandas. So I think that's something that needs to be looked at more carefully. Um, so moving forward, again, we discussed this um, over and over again. We need prospective studies. You know, it's, it's very interesting when people report their case reports. We've got about 150 patients we've we reported on metoxin um, that were, we are looking at the, the outcome of that, and it's very positive. Um, but, you know, it's, it's still a retrospective study. You know, we need prospective studies. We need to 
we need and we need to collect as many people as possible and as many centers as possible so that there's no inherent bias in the individual person who's treating the kids and um, and we don't have that right now and we need a place for these patients to be treated which we also don't have right now and those are the two biggest challenges that I see at this point oh and education I'm going to tell you about a first grade teacher about five ten years ago she was beaten up in the classroom thrown in the closet, hit over the head with a chair, and she called the parents in. She didn't know what Pandas was. And she said, your child has strep. Just take him to the doctor. And she said, I've only seen something like this happen once before, but I, this, your child has strep. Just take him to the doctor. And they went to the pediatrician. The pediatrician was like, what are you doing here? Well, the first grade teacher said he had strep because <laughs> she threw him in the closet. <laughs> And it, it, it was a pandas case, but once, like, once you see this, and like, I, I think this is the problem with pediatricians. What, what, if they don't see, if you can't see something because you're not aware of it, you're not going to recognize it. And I also tell parents all the time, please, I beg you, do not get so mad at your pediatrician that you can't go back in there after you treated them and show them the outcome of the treatment. Because unless they've seen before, during and after, they will continue to be polluted by the non-believers or the, or the controversy. So the more people that we had, we had a lot of doctors and nurses from all over the country last night, and I suspect many of those individual doctors had children with pandas. And they will come from one area and they will educate the entire area around them. And um, we also had some insurance companies there too, so hopefully that'll make a big difference. To give, uh, nurse case managers from both Blue Cross Blue Shield and uh, United Healthcare. Um, of course, they're trying to figure out what's the most economical way to treat these children, which is the argument that I make all the time. It's cheaper to treat them than it is to deny the treatment. Um, moral, moral, you know, morality aside, you know, because really, that's really all they care about is the economics, the insurance companies, and the states as well. The special education costs, all that. It costs a fortune. Writing IEP plans. One thing I've noticed in the last six months is so striking to me. It's really been in the last six months. All the kids come in to see me, and I don't think I'm doing this good of a job, but they say, I say, how are you doing in school? Straight A's, straight A's, straight A's. I'm thinking, my kids didn't get straight A's. You know, what, what's going on? I think the teachers are just so beaten down by parents coming in and writing IEPs and getting good grades that they're just giving all the kids A's. It just makes their life easier. But it's been, it's, it's absolutely striking what, what has occurred. And you know, they can do tests over again, they can write papers, the homework can come in two weeks later, it doesn't matter, like, there's like no rules anymore. And I think that that's the end of my slides. All right, Dr. Latimer.